I mentioned the uh, mineral railways. The mineral railways came down. Uh, one of them landed at a little key, which was known as the Cowper, which was the place where the railway curved the minerals into the large have the found Cowper. This is the remnants of a swing bridge, which took the railway across the canal and on to the Great Glasgow Edinburgh Line and the Marsh Line. Uh, there's two sides to it. The, um, the traffic cone isn't the Jure de Spring, part of a passing Lewis. It is actually a traffic cone telling people not to get too close to these rather nasty things sticking out the side of the canal. And the villages. These are six of them. These are the ones which were um, built by the company. There people, miners were living in other places too, but these were the company ones. Um, these three have completely disappeared under new housing. Bishopbrooks has gone from 5,000 to 30,000 in 50 years. Lots and lots of places have completely disappeared. This one, this one has also disappeared, but we don't really know why. It's on the map, but nobody knows exactly where it is. These two are the ones which have still got some remnants on the ground. And I'm going to talk about Mavis Valley. Surprise, surprise. This was Mavis Valley in 1910, and you could see it was at its most successful and most heavy. Um, it was built in the 1850s, not quite sure when, um, but it doesn't appear in the 1851 census. It does appear in the later censuses, and for a long time it had 24 house, households, not houses, households. Um, it acquired another four, possibly still living in the 24 houses that were before, in 1891. Then in 1901, we jumped up to 72. This is after these pits have been opened. And in 1910, which we'll come to, um, there are even more. This is the first edition of the survey, and it shows Mavis Valley as it was when it was first built. There's your uh, little bit alongside the canal, and a little bit in a straight line up here, and up here is a well. That's all the water supply. Uh, there is a report on miners' housing dated 18, uh, 1910, and in that you find that uh, it mentions Mavis Valley. The old houses, four one apartments and 20 two apartments, one story, stone built, <sighs> no gardens, no wash houses. Uh, no coal cellars, pretty middens, some not sufficiently private, and sinks outside. I love this bit about scavenged regularly at owners' expense. <laughs> How generous. Uh, now, the later Mayors Valley, 116 houses, situated to the east of number 17 mine, blah, 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 blah. Two rows with good space between. And there's the map of the second edition, which shows the whole of the new Mavis Valley. You'll see that there are slightly different forms of building. Uh, the report tells us that there were a number of one-story blocks, a number of two apartment blocks, and four houses of three apartments, um, brick-built with a damp roof, of course, modern ideas creeping in. Um, no overcrowding apartments good size, no gardens, but they have wash houses and full cellars. Things are improving a bit. They have sinks in the scullery, but it's still gravitation water is not coming in a pipe they supply. Scavenge regularly owners' expense. So then Mills Valley, 1910. Uh, I think this might be one of the oldest houses, I'm not sure. These are the new uh, single-story houses and the two-story houses. And we think the, that might be the three apartments. We're not absolutely sure. It's kind of hard to tell. Um, this is Mavis Valley today. Not a lot left. We did a survey, and as you can see, there aren't very many recognizable features. This area here was the little bit of the old village that's left. And it's basically just a pile of stones. Initially, we didn't actually recognize it as, as part of the old village. But the thing about doing a site 
this kind of age is that every so often elderly gentlemen turn up and say, oh, I used to live here. <coughs> and one elderly gentleman turned up and he told us that that was where, I don't know, that was where the original uh, old houses were, the ones here and the one here. The report says that there were stone built, and you can't tell this from the fact that well, that's a pile of stone, but also along the central um, part of the village, the path up is lined with what appear to be cobblestones, but are in fact the detritus of destroying that particular section. And then you have houses both here and here, very little recognisable in shape. This one here is probably the most recognisable feature. And one of the things we were able to use as a kind of key to what's going on is this plan, which appears again in this report of miners' housing. It's tremendously useful piece of information. And it tells us that these were the three apartments with the kitchen, a room, and a room, and the scullery. And the WC, one WC for the whole, whole thing, which we're talking about four, houses, four families living in this block. So there's one WC between them, but I'm sure they managed. This, in, on the site, was, we think, the remnants of possibly that building. Because you may have noticed on the plan, there was a partly decorative feature along the foot of the wall. And this is yellow brick with a chamfered edge. And it's definitely a decorative feature, not a structural one. And then here, you can actually see a bit of damp roof growth. So that's the, the brick built, the red brick built, and the yellow walls. Uh, odds and ends, not very much we could find. Um, that might be a um, window sill. <coughs> this is something to do with the drainage. For the new houses, they had drainage. They didn't have sewage, but they had drainage. And that's got sort of um, porcelain structure to it. This is a chimney, the top of a chimney with a to be onto it. Uh, this is the back of the uh, ash pit for the very old part of the village. On the west side, as you go up the hill, a bit of a, a, a dyke sort of thing comes up that has a little slope. And when we investigated, this slope had gaps in it, and one of the gaps had steps. So we reckon that was probably a drying view that was added in when the newer houses were built. Somewhat later in the development of Nevis Valley, um, we don't have um, electricity, of course. We didn't have piped gas, of course. And we didn't have proper um, water supply and we didn't have proper sewage. This is a massive chunk of concrete just beside the canal and it houses the um, very large water the water pipe, which has taken it on up the hill. It wasn't really meant for Mavis Valley. This was actually put in in 1940, by which time Mavis Valley was in its last legs. And it's essentially a connection over from Bridge, Bridge, which came under the canal. And one of the things about archaeology is you see things, and when you get explanations, you realise how they all fit in. When they put the, the pipe under the canal, it was 1940, the canal was still functioning, and in fact it had a certain function during the war. There's a lovely story about a miniature submarine which got trapped in the canal by ice. <laughs> uh, so they had to keep the canal open, so what they did was they built a kind of case and were dried off, and that's the remnants of it. And they halved the canal, half of the canal was dry, they put in this pipe, and then they shifted it around to the other side, put in the other half, and you ended up with that great massive chunk of concrete. But as I say, not really intended for the benefit of Mavis Valley. This is the last feature that was built at Mavis Valley. When we first went in, we knew what it was. It's obviously not a house. It doesn't have a door leading out to the main road. What on earth was it? Well, I discovered that soldiers were billeted in Mavis Valley in the 40s. And along with the soldiers, there was an ammunition dump. And that is the ammunition dump. That was the last thing that was built at Mavis Valley. That's another picture of it. Another picture of it. Now, why was I interested in Mavis Valley? 
It's not terribly rewarding to take, and there's not very much left. But then something happened on Sunday, the 3rd of August, 1913. And what happened was, in Cabot 15, the back shift went down about 6 o'clock in the afternoon. They were down there about two hours, and then the fireman, fireman in this context is not a man who puts fires out, it's a man who identifies potential fires. And it was his job to go down and check that everything was safe before the next shift went down. So the fireman went down and he, he discovered that fire had broken out. So he rushed off and he found three men whom he warned. These men were able to escape because between Cadre 15 and Cadre 17, um, there was a, a tunnel, yeah, fine. Um, there was a tunnel, and they were able to get along the tunnel. But unfortunately, Mr. Riley, the fireman, went back to warn the others, and he was too late for them, and he was too late for him. They were all killed. 22 men were killed here. Some of them from Mavis Valley, the two brothers Ramsey, the three brothers Brown, all from Mavis Valley. One story I find particularly moving for some reason, is Owen McAloo. Uh, Owen was 15, he was a pony driver, that's the man who led the pony, who was bringing the bogies along. And Owen was found, apart from the others, his dead body, with the dead body of his pony, and his arms around the pony's neck. Uh, and here's another name to remember, Pat Duffin. He wasn't from uh, Mavis Valley, he was from Lamb Hill. But there's a certain significance to his name because the reason why we got involved in this was we felt it was important that the centenary of this disaster be remembered and remembered in a particular way. You'll know that Glasgow has an unfortunate reputation for having Catholics and Protestants and never the twins for me. And some of these men, many of them, as you can see from the name, were Irish and they were buried in St. Pentagon's. They have a big memorial in St. Pentagon's, and then the others were buried in various places, and a big memorial for them in Cadder, but no memorial for everybody. Now, they lived together. They worked together. They died together. <clears throat> Maybe they should all be remembered together. That was the funeral of the men from Mavis Valley, and you can actually see in the distance the mine. The company paid for these rather elaborate funerals, you've not been surprised to hear, and they did actually show out a little bit, but anyway. The other thing, important thing about this was that there had been a Mine Safety uh, Act 1911, which the car company had blindly ignored. They were supposed to have um, safety lamps, they were still using open lamps, uh, oil lamps with wicks. They were supposed to have breathing apparatus, the company said it didn't work. There was supposed to be a mine safety rescue team close by. The nearest one was in Fife and it took four hours to get there. It wasn't awfully helpful when it did. So, the other thing to do is this particular disaster actually prodded the mine coal owners into <coughs> implementing these uh, things in the 1911 Act. One small side issue of the 1911 Act is it also contained measures for the uh, care of pit ponies. And that measure was pressed for by somebody called um, Sir Harry Lauder. Harry Lauder started his life in the mines and he was a pony driver and he was very anxious that the ponies should be treated as well as possible given what they were being asked to do. So that was the funeral of the men from Mavis Valley. And then 100 years on, I'm said to remember the name Pat Duffin. These are his great grandchildren at the memorial to all the men, all together now, and they are um, they are indicating that all these men, all these people who lived, worked, died in the mine are now remembered together. It was quite amazing how many family members, descendants, and in fact they advertised it quite widely. It was, it was in the Glasgow Herald, it was in the News, 
and there was quite a lot of internet um, remarks, people getting in touch from South Africa, from Canada, from Australia, <laughs> staggered at the number of people who seemed to have connections with Mavis Valley. But that's the story, that's the story of Mavis Valley. We wanted to be sure that the men were remembered, we wanted to be sure that the significance of the um, disaster, which although they lost their lives, must have saved others, and that is why the local authority, under the leadership of the Provost, Ian Walker, uh, arranged this um, project and we have achieved what we wanted to do. That's the story of Mavis Valley. Nobody lives there now, so I leave you with the nearest neighbours. <laughs>